Hello and welcome uh, to this lecture. My name is Dr. Gareth Movena. I'm a long-term friend and colleague of Tony's and I'd just like to extend my gratitude to Tony for um, inviting me to give this lecture as part of his Ireland's Loyal Rebels course, The Protestants of Ulster. Uh, basically what I'm going to be talking about tonight is the research uh, that informed my book Tartan Gangs and Paramilitaries but also the broader um, discourses, stories, narratives around the emergence of loyalist paramilitarism in the early 1970s in Northern Ireland. So I'll be sort of going back and forth between reading from some literature and giving some of my thoughts on, on the events of, the, of that period in time. But what, what I want to start by doing is giving a bit of background about who I am. So say my name is Dr. Gareth Mulvena. I did my PhD in Queen's University Belfast on the Protestant working class experience of the Troubles from pre-Troubles pre um, to the post-conflict era, uh, looking at the social and political uh, factors that played into the sense of community or, or lack thereof as, as it came, came about. And after I finished in Queen's, I went on to work in the Northern Ireland Assembly for three years. I've worked for the historical institutional abuse inquiry. Most recently I worked for the renewable heat incentive inquiry and um, in between all this I've kept up my research into loyalism and in 2016 my first book was published Tartan Gangs and Paramilitaries uh, The Loyalist Backlash was published by Liverpool University Press and basically that book started off as an investigation um, of the, the Tartan Gangs um, which in, in anything I read about the, the Troubles had always been a footnote basically but I always thought there was maybe more of a story to be told and bet between one thing and another basically Tony um, initially put me in touch with Dr William Mitchell from the ACT Initiative um, William was very helpful in the early days talking about his own research and his own experiences of being a young loyalist paramilitary in the 1970s and then um, William put me in touch with Robert Niblock, who is a, also a former Loyalist prisoner, um, who has written a significant amount of poetry and plays, including a play called Tartan. So obviously himself and Pino hit it off um, and we've been friends for nearly 10 years. And Pino Niblock had the same uh, sort of life experience interest in the Tartan gangs as I had in the subject as a researcher. He was keen to look back in that period of time and write about it uh, from art an artistic point of view. I was keen to look back and write about it from, a, from an academic, uh, academic perspective. So basically uh, that book was published in 2016. Subsequently um, I've been invited by Billy Hutchinson and um, later the Progressive Unionist Party to collaborate on writing his autobiography which will be published by Marian Press and should be out either later this year or early next year. Say things are a bit up in the air at the moment with this whole um, pandemic um, outbreak. So um, we're just, it's a movable feast at the moment basically, but it'll it'll be on bookshelves, hopefully end of this year, start of the, start of the next year at the, at the very latest. Um, so basically, why did I write Tartan Gangs and Paramilitaries? Well, the reason, as I say before, was because I'd read a lot of books about the Troubles. The first book I ever read about the Troubles was as a 16 year old Catholic from North Belfast. I read The Shankle Butchers by Martin Dillon. It was one of those sort of books that was passed around to everybody um, in those days. And, you know, The Shankle Butchers, even in 1996, were, you know, the ultimate boogeyman for young, young men like myself. Um, living on the Antrim Road, um, you know, it wasn't that long in the past really from, from where we stood at that time and a lot of people who read that book I think went on and took that as their definitive picture of loyalism, paramilitary loyalism, but it always troubled me that this was, this couldn't be the only story, um, a story about psychopaths, people with pathological behaviour, you know, while the IRA were 
being portrayed in a lot of books, particularly Tim Pat Coogan and that type of thing that I was reading at the time, they were being portrayed as freedom fighters and heroes. And as I say, I'm from a Catholic background. Um, you know, a lot of people I went to school with would have um, been from, you know, Republican enclaves and would have had that experience. Luckily, I I grew up in a sort of not a political background in 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 terms of the fact that my parents were alliance voters, but um, I was always very aware of the fact that you know there was there was more texture to to um, people's life experiences than maybe have been portrayed in a book such as The Shankle Butchers. For me, the road to Damascus uh, moment was when I read Loyalists by Peter Taylor in 1999. I just found that to be a, a fantastic book and television documentary. Um, I remember Peter Taylor came to launch the book in Waterstones in uh, Royal Avenue in Belfast. And just to hear him speak about um, his interviews, face-to-face -face interviews with leading members of the UVF, Red Hand Commando and um, Ulster Defence Association was just absolutely fascinating as a, as a young man to, to see the humanity of these people really. But also the thing that always struck me about the, the Loyalist documentary, seeing people like Billy Hutchinson um, talk with... Um, I think it was the Guardian were reviewing the documentary, and they sort of stated that you know Billy had talked with uh, Billy and and the other uh, interviewees had talked with a uh, sort of no no varnish really to the story. Um, the 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 were straight shooters that told it down the line. There was no uh, sort of party political um, interference in what they were trying to say. It was all a very human story. So I always find that very interesting, and you know for years I always thought it would be fantastic to write a book like that. Um, now, I wouldn't put myself up with Peter Taylor by any means, but luckily um, one thing led to another with the research into the Tartan Gangs in, in I think it was 2013, I started that research and Bino Niblock, who was a former member of the Red Hand Commando, subsequently put me in touch with um, some of the, well, the, the, the person who started the Red Hand Commando organisation, uh, Ronnie Flint McCulloch. We started the Red Hand Commando in 1970 with some friends from the old park and Shankill areas. So basically, it went from being a story, just uh, or a study of the, of the Tartan Gang phenomenon, to being more of a a, a sort of um, story about how one element of the Tartan in East Belfast merged with the um, Red Hand Commando on the Shankill and became a unit of of that nascent organisation who were very active before the UVF um, uh, were resurrected in April 1972 and before the UDA really um, became a, a major a major force. So basically I'm going to ha have to refer to some slides on the computer here so forgive me for if I'm turning away from the, the camera it's the first time I've kind of done anything like this so um, just bear with me while I um, go through some of the slides and I, I I have to say, I will make these slides available to Tony and he can distribute them to the class so you guys can see the slides, the pictures. I've also incorporated some video footage of, of the time that is commonly referred to in the press and co contemporaneously as the, the Loyalist backlash. There was a lot of expectation in 1971, early 1972, of, of, of a Loyalist backlash. A Protestant backlash, what will this backlash be and what form will it take? So basically, just to go back a wee bit and probably to cover territory, you know, that's well well uh, trod over in, in this course. Uh, but, you know, we'll look back to February 1962 um, and the end of the IRA's border campaign. Um, and the statement by the IRA which stated the leadership of the resistance movement has ordered the termination of the campaign of resistance to British occupation, which had been launched on December the 12th, 1956. So, I mean, at that stage, early 1960s, uh, to all intents and purposes, the IRA campaign was over. Uh, it had ended in surrender, basically. Um, it had been an unsuccessful six-year campaign along the border, border regions. And still, um, Republicans, the IRA, were no closer to a united Ireland, um, as they had so wished. But in terms of the overall uh, context of the era, this didn't stop political manoeuvring and chicanery within unionism. 
because after Prime Minister Terence O'Neill, sorry, Captain Terence O'Neill became Prime Minister in 1962, he reached out a sort of liberal hand of friendship towards the Republic of Ireland. He tried to, um, to a certain extent, bring Catholics into the fold by you know giving them a slightly greater stake in society, and um. There were a lot of opponents of this liberal reform within the Unionist Party who, um, coming up to the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising in 1966, perhaps saw this as an opportunity to rock the boat slightly and, and make uh, life uncomfortable for Terence O'Neill. So, <clears throat> when you come up to 1966, in um, 1965, the Ulster Volunteer Force um, had been created in 1965 by um, anti-O'Neill unionists and, and some other loyalist um, factions who were who were um, disenchanted and, and um, annoyed at O'Neill's liberal reformism. And in 1966 you have the formation of the Ulster Protestant Volunteers um, formed by Ian Paisley and a man called Mo Doherty. They opposed the liberalism of O'Neill and they were connected to the Ulster Constitution Defence Committee. Now, members of this organisation were involved in some, like, uh, what, what are termed false flag bombings in the late 60s, and um, uh, a man called John McCaig was very uh, uh, prominent in this, this organisation at the time. John went on to become the leader of the Shankill Defence Association, which was uh, very prominent during the convulsions of the summer of 1969, and John went on to become the figurehead of the Red Hand Commando, which was formed by Ronnie McCulloch and other young men in 1970, June 1970. <clears throat> so, in May 1966, the UVF make, makes its first uh, public statement. Now, this UVF, Ulster Volunteer Force, although it was clandestine and secretive, it would have seen itself as a legitimate error of the previous UVF, um, that existed to oppose Home Rule in the early part of the 20th century and whose members ultimately, um, many of whom uh, perished on the, the, the battlefield of the Somme in, in uh, 1916. So, just to read this statement, I'm sure you all know it, but it's, again, it's to give context. Um, Captain William Johnston, which is the pen name, like P. O'Neill for the IRA, um, the statement on the 21st of May 1966, read, from this day we declare war against the Irish Republican Army and its splinter groups. No one IRA men will be executed mercilessly and without hesitation. Less extreme measures will be taken against anyone sheltering or helping them. But if they persist in giving them aid, then more extreme methods will be adopted. We solemnly warn the authorities to make no more speeches of appeasement. We are heavily armed Protestants dedicated to this cause. So it's a very ominous warning and obviously around that time a few Catholics are shot dead, um, most famously uh, young Peter Ward, a uh, uh, Catholic barman who was enjoying a drink in the in uh, Watson's pub in, in Malvern Street in June 1966. This led to the arrest of Dusty Spence and a number of other UVF men from, um, from the Shankill area. And thereafter the UVF sort of seemed to disappear until 1971-72 um, and uh, in that period of time a lot of UVF members would have been involved in infiltrating Tara which was even by the UVF standards a very clandestine group uh, which was run by William McGrath and was full of basically informants and agents at that stage. Um, at that stage Gusty, Gusty Spence is um, something of a, um, a sort of Kitchener figure. He's a He's a figurehead. He's a poster boy of, of 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 the loyalist cause. Of, but but at the same time, it's important to remember that a lot of people on the Shankill and in other loyalist, um, Protestant working class areas would have been completely disgusted at what um, the UVF had done. They saw murder as completely unjustifiable. Um, but within the loyalist subculture that would have surrounded Gusty, there was a lot of myth making, and I think it was Gusty himself, in from the no jail, who wrote um, the ballad "The Man in the Black Soft Hat." Again, that's something I put in the slide and I'll send over to Tony, but it's a brilliant, you know, sort of evocative piece of prose in terms of capturing that sense of Gusty as, you know, the man with the jutted jaw, with the black hat, um, 
you know, the sort of powerful presence that people would have been drawn to at that stage. And subsequently, when, when young men came into Long Cash, as Aaron will have talked about, um, you know, he was he was very much the go to guy in terms of, you know, um questioning young men about their um motivations and, and making them think, pushing them a bit further. Obviously not universally popular by any stretch of the imagination, but definitely maybe um exactly what loyalism needed at a certain point in time when, when people did begin to question what was going on with the, the IRA campaign. And interestingly one, uh, I mean, I don't want to dwell on the 1960s for too long, um, but an interesting one that I found, I, I mean, one of the resources I love is um, Hansard. I, I just um, haven't worked in the Northern Ireland Assembly. I'm just obsessed with the Hansard. Um, and I always find you can, um, like, discover nice wee nuggets in, in the Hansard, which maybe other researchers might bypass. But, you know, I'd always advocate Hansard as a, as a sort of resource for, for finding out little bits and pieces. And um, on the 30th of June, 1966, after young Peter Ward was um, callously shot dead, uh, Harry Diamond, uh, the Republican MP, um, stood up in, in, in Stormont in the Parliament and made a fascinating speech, um, which I'm going to read two excerpts from, which, which shows that there was even a sort of you, what you'll see in the early 70s is there's a multitude of loyalist organisations and political enterprises and, and, and youth subculture gangs. But even in this period in 66, people were playing around with names, different organisations, experimenting with different microgroups. So Harry Diamond said, On the day when many of these events occurred, I personally received a telephone call, and it was not from a telephone kiosk. It was from a gentleman who stated he was Captain Marshall of the Shankill Volunteer Division. He threatened me that if I opened my mouth. It was drawn to my attention also that there are quite a number of organisations operating. We know one has already been banned by O'Neill, the Ulster Volunteer Force. But another one was mentioned to me under the initials SRRC, SRRS, the Sandy Row Revenge Squad. And a third one mentioned the other day was the Peep Day Boys, evoking a past organisation. These members, I understand, are taking an oath to deal with Catholics and with Protestants who associate with or mix in any way or deal with Catholics. So again, that's just an interesting sort of wee nugget. <clears throat> just to fast forward slightly, look, um, January 1970, um, following the split between the split of the IRA into the two wings, you have the emergence of the provisional IRA and then the, the more um, sort of... Uh, Marxist leaning um, official IRA and um, the two different organizations ultimately become known as the Stickies and the Provos. Um, June 1970 is uh, well, June 1970 is a as a in in the research that I did, it's a, it's a landmark um, period in time for for loyalist organizing. You've got in East Belfast, you've got the so-called Battle of St. Matthews, the Siege of St. Matthews, um, whatever you want to call it, but um, there's a lot of narratives surrounding that event on both sides of the sectarian divide. And I think it was Peter Taylor who said that, you know, he'd written with almost a, a large degree of confidence that, you know, the Republican narrative was right until he went to interview um, Loyalists from East Belfast who were able to put forward their version of events of that, of that day at the end of June 1970 were, you know, they were very vociferous that this was a planned IRA attack. And events in North and West Belfast maybe play, play that out a wee bit because the Orange March in West Belfast, the White Rock Parade, was attacked by Republican youths and ultimately on the Crumlin Road, um... The provisional IRA and Ardoin opened fire on, on orange men marching um, in the sort of Woodville and uh, Crumlin Road area. And this is sort of like a pivotal moment in, in my research in terms of the story of the Red Hand Commando. Um, again, it, it, the Red Hand Commando has always been a, a sort of footnote in, in, in historiographies of the Troubles. And I think my, my book was the first one to, to give the Red Hand their sort of place in the historical narrative. By, by actually speaking to people who were involved in the organisation and involved in that initial uh, formation of it. Um, yeah, so I mean, 
the classic one is Jerry Adams in, in the Before the Dawn autobiography from 1996, where he talks about, um, you know, there's that whole myth that, you know, um, after Bombay Street in 1969 and the, and the so-called pogroms, um, that uh, there was graffiti on the walls in West Belfast saying IRA stood for I ran away. And I think it's Brian Hanley's completely, you know, dismissed that as just a, an apocryphal sort of uh, sort of um, narrative but uh, certainly Jerry Adams when he when he writes about June 1970 in his um, Before the Dawn autobiography he states in this instance the IRA were ready and waiting so you can make of that what you will but a lot of loyalists would point to that and say well you know there you go um, the IRA were obviously primed for a spectacular which would uh, allow them to retain or, or get get some sort of uh, uh, kudos with, with the Republican community after the events of the of, uh, summer of 1969. Now, <clears throat> I interviewed Ronnie McCulloch at length about um, this uh, June 1970 event, and Ronnie was one of the members of Prince Albert Temperance um, Orange Lodge, who had been marching on the Crumlin Road uh, when the provisional IRA opened open fire from Ardoin and uh, Ronnie and other like-minded loyalists uh, Ronnie was from the Old Park Road area and of North Belfast they met in his mother's house basically and I'll just read from the interview that I did with Ronnie he says I and several other friends decided that we would meet in a house in the Old Park Road it happened to be my mother's house in Rosevale Street we discussed the situation of what had happened. We would need to do something about it, otherwise it could happen again and again and again. And we would need to make a stand. We basically decided we would form an organisation and we would ultimately train and arm the recruit to prevent similar circumstances happening again. And he goes on to talk about basically what the birth... It's basically the birth certificate of the Red Hand Commando. He says, in effect, we agreed on two founding principles for this proposed organisation. The first founding principle we agreed on was that we would fight them and remain British, and we would not be forced into an All-Ireland Republic from Republican activities. And secondly, that we would fight to defend the Protestant people, or Loyalist people, our communities from Republican aggression. Now, at this stage, um, Flint would have been, Ronnie Flint McCulloch would have been the, 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 the prime uh, person in terms of organising the Red Hand Commando. Uh, there was other people around at that stage who subsequently went on to become notorious in, in the in the Loyalist um, paramilitary culture. Desi Balmer, um, I think Spider McVeigh maybe, and a few other, John Bingham as well. Um, these were all Loyalists who were eager to do something at the time and who coalesced around this nascent organisation which became the Red Hand Commando officially um, in subsequent months. But basically, um, I'm sure a lot of you have read Plum Smith's autobiography, Inside Man. And Plum came along slightly later in 1970. And he says, Our first trawl of weapons looked like something from a World War One museum. With bolt action stare and Torino rifles, shotguns, a few handguns and very little ammunition. Now, I mentioned John McCaig before and again. John, like the Tartans, like the Red Hand Commando has always been relegated to a footnote in his in the historiographies of the Northern Irish Troubles. Um, where he is mentioned, it's it's usually um, in the sensationalistic accounts based on very little evidence. Uh, more moreover, it's based on conjecture about the sexuality, about concora, about different things where there's there's uh, very little very little or no evidence really to back things up. Um, but but um, at this time at this stage. Uh, people like Flint and um, his comrades in the Red Hand saw John as being a loyalist leader, somebody who was very vociferous in his loyalist point of view. He published the Loyalist News at the time and he was seen as somebody who could perhaps access money and weapons and that's what these young loyalists wanted. Um, as I say, he was leader of the Shankill Defence Association at this time and he um, had uh, sort of struck out in his own um, at this stage and was looking for an organisation to lead. And Ro Ronnie uh, Flint McCulloch say, said to me in, in, our, in my interview with him, whenever it was put to John McCaig what the aims of this new group were, 
and what their objectives were, he fully endorsed them and encouraged them to link in with those people who were already members of the Schenkel Defence Association and felt the same way. It ended up that numbers of Schenkel Defence Association members became close to this new grouping and in actual fact they all amalgamated and formed one grouping which was later to become the Red Hand Commando. So I want to backtrack slightly at this point um, because I want to explain the origins of the Tartan Gangs. And to give a bit of context to the, the times that we're talking about, I'm going to read from um, an interview that Colin Crawford carried out with Sammy Duddy. Now, Sammy Duddy became a very prominent member of the Ulster Defence Association and was a key propagandist in, in, the, um, in that organisation. Uh, Sammy talked about the, the, the summer of 1969 where you, know, you had the riots on the Shankill and on the falls and in, and, and in Derry as well. Um, but, but he makes an interesting point when he talks about this period. He said, Catholics and Protestants in the Shankill and Falls had been like followers of different football teams before that summer. There was rivalry and fights. That's just the way it was. And you expected that. But then the guns came out and people got shot and got shot dead. And then everything changes. Can you imagine if Manchester United and Liverpool fans were facing each other in Wembley Stadium? And suddenly a Liverpool supporter shoots a Manchester United fan. All hell would break loose and the Liverpool supporters would be annihilated. Well, that's just the way it was on Bombay Street that night. Um, and it comes to my mind, I actually, just thinking about the Ardoin and the Schenkel. At this, at this period of time, um, well, sorry, slightly before this, in, in the, probably in the late 50s actually, I was talking to a very senior member of the UVF who would be in his probably mid-70s now. And he talked about this, well, I mentioned to him the idea of the tartan gangs and, and the, the sort of antecedent gangs that had always existed in industrialised cities like Belfast. And he said that he remembered as a young fella from, from the Shanko uh, fight, fighting with gangs from the Ardoin and Martin Meehan, who became obviously a commander of, of the Ardoin IRA, um, being one of the, his adversaries in, in these gang fights. So these... Um, grudges and rivalries that existed before the Troubles carried on through the early Troubles and right through to the point where these uh, two gentlemen that I'm, I'm talking about here would have been trying to get at each other right up until you know the, the Troubles ended almost in, in well the ceasefires were called in the mid 90s so it's interesting how that, that gang mentality the rivalries between um, prominent people in gangs becomes a sort of um, uh, almost like a, a sort of greenhouse for for the um, paramilitary rivalries that would come later. Um, so to, to explain a wee bit about the Tartan Gangs, I just want to go back to my own book and talk about the origins. Now, as I say, a lot of the stories of, of um, the Troubles and how things started and what way things happened are, are apocryphal and open to interpretation or challenge. But I was amazed when I found this story from a guy called Bo Dyer from the Shankill. Bo Dyer um, grew up in the same street as um, Lenny Murphy and, and his uh, brothers. And um, Bo, although he was never involved in paramilitarism, he would have been involved in following Linfield in the 1960s and would have been friendly with a lot of um, people who did go on to become prominent loyalists. And when I found this story when I heard the story from uh, Mr. Dyer I went to other people with it and it was almost unanimous that people said yeah that actually sounds right whereas you'd expect maybe people in East Belfast to say nah we started it or you know people in South Belfast but no there was actual sort of you know um agreement that this this probably was the origin of the of the Tartan gangs so basically um it ties in with the whole dynamic of the of the culture of supporting rangers going over to Glasgow, the idea of the tartan, that type of thing. So I'm just going to read an excerpt from the book here, and uh, it's just excuse excuse me for looking down, um, because I have to read read straight from the book here. Um, so basically, other matters away from the political turbulence consumed young Protestants at this time. Jim Tipping was a fervent rangers supporter, and states that it was during regular trips to Glasgow in the late 1960s that the tartan scarf, 
which would eventually become popular with loyalist youth gangs in the early 1970s, was adopted by young men from Belfast. I used to go over the Ibrox all the time. It was to do with the Rangers matches. There was all different tartans. You had the blue tartan, the McGregor tartan and all. Who Dyer was a teenager living on the Shankill in the late 1960s. He recalls, I was starting to go to Linfield games with Frankie Curry and Spider and Roy Stewart and Devil. And we were fervent Linfield supporters, absolute hooligans as well. This was around 1967 and some of the lads who followed Linfield in the area became known as the Shankill Young Team. A moniker similar to the violent Glaswegian gangs of the time. Like Tipping and hundreds of other young lads from the Shankill, Dyer and Frankie Curry were also Rangers supporters. Dyer remembers that he and Curry once found themselves in a gift shop in Glasgow where they stole a box which contained Burberry style scarves. He handed them out to friends in Belfast and remembers that one evening, on entering the Crown Snooker Hall in the Shankill, someone shouted, Here's the Tartan coming! It changed from Shankill Young Team to Shankill Young Tartan. So again, that's an early um, mention of the Tartan. That would have been, I think, 68, 69, probably before the convulsions of, of the summer of 69. But it gives you an idea that this sort of uh, Tartan sim symbolism wasn't a political symbol symbolism as such, as such as it became part of the um, political response by 1970, 71, which I'll, I'll go on to explain in a, in a, in a wee, wee bit here. But... Just to go back to the, the actual narrative of events, um, February 1971, you have the IRA murder of uh, Gunnar Robert Curtis, uh, the first British soldier to be called in the Troubles. March 1971, you have the murder of the three young Scottish Fusiliers. Now, it's around about this time, March, April, where although the tartan exists, you have a, a sort of... Um, explosion of, of the tartan as a as a mode of rep representing um political and and um sectarian dynamics in, in behavior so basically I, I just want to read uh another little bit from from um the book uh where Bino Niblock uh talks about the uh tartan culture and how it played out with the, the Woodstock um Woodstock Tartan in East Belfast. At the Saturday match and in Belfast's industrial workplaces, news of the Shankill Young Tartan spread to young men in other parts of the city, and East Belfast in particular. By early 1971, the Young Hatons, the gang that Bino was involved in, had evolved into the Woodstock Tartan. Niblock states, I think the Tartan movement as a whole, not just the individual gangs, ended up being political in regard to what was going on around us at that time. I neither formed nor joined the Tartan gang. I merged into one from another gang. The only difference in both was the wearing of scarves and of course how we were known. The name Woodstock Tartan was easily chosen as it identified geographically where we came from. Young Hatons didn't. So although Northern Ireland in the early 1970s was considered to be a place apart from the rest of the UK, Many of the rituals and cultural references associated with the Tartans would have been similar to other youth gangs in industrial cities such as Glasgow, Dundee, Edinburgh, Liverpool and Manchester. Bino remembers the importance of fashion to the Tartans. He says, The uniform for the Tartan gangs all over Northern Ireland was of course Wranglers. Prior to this, teenagers would have worn a cheaper version, Wagoners, or a hideous pair of jeans called Sea Dogs or made from Libro, complete with bell bottoms of course. Wrangler denim was popular at the time and was worn by many young men who listened to rock music but became especially associated with the tartan culture. Bino says, On some occasions an instruction was given, say if we were going to a special fight with a rival gang, that everyone should wear a black Ben Sherman check shirt. Boots of course were very important, not just for fighting but for looks. The high-legged Doc Martens, Oxblood, complemented the washed out jeans but not everyone wore Doc Martens. Some wore steel toe cap boots from their place of work, others preferred Oxford boots or dealer boots. Some liked steel tips on them that clicked when you walked, others preferred the spongy soles that made it easier to run. And I think it's fascinating when you, when you look at this period of time, how when the newspapers were trying to sum up what 
uh, Protestant violence looked like. If there was an image to define the Protestant backlash, it wasn't the UVF man in a balaclava. It wasn't a UDA man in a bush hat and sunglasses. Or, or I'd say UVF man in a balaclava or a cap comforter or a leather jacket. The Sunday News published this picture in May 1972, which was entitled Protestant Violence. As you can see, it's a tartan scarf, pair of skinners and DM boots. It says Protestant Violence on it. So, basically, these events um, gave rise to a uh, proliferation of, of, the, of the tartan gangs in, in March 1971. Uh, young fellows who maybe weren't interested in the tartan symbolism before March 1971 saw the murder of the three Scottish soldiers as a, as a reason to wear the tartan and to identify, show solidarity with the Scottish uh, 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 soldiers who had been killed by the IRA. April 1971, the newsletter publishes a front page article saying, um, I think the headline was, Gang Warfare is New Threat to Belfast Peace. And it talks about two gangs in the Shankle called the Tartan and the Rats fighting with each other and how this was really the big thing. It wasn't anything to do with the loyalist organisations or even the IRA, that these Protestant gangs fighting with each other was... The, the big threat to the uh, security of, of people in Ulster. But these fears are then raised in June 1971 in, in the Storm of Parliament again by Austin Curry, who talks about blue boys in Denham, um, a Denham army marshalling our, the Orange Parades that June, and talks about them being like a paramilitary force. And Austin Curry was probably a lot um, closer to the truth than a lot of unionists even were at the time. Who were who were in denial that there was any um sort of um loyalist response um occurring. I'd say the Tartans were the most visual um indicator of a of a Protestant backlash at, at this period of time. So you have a variety of gangs. Uh, there was the Shankel Young Tartan, the Rats, the Woodstock Tartan, the Ulster Boot Boys, the Orange Peel, the Rathcool Kai. Um, these were all uh groups that were heralded by John McCaig and and uh, and the loyalist community more more broadly as being the sort of galvanizing positive force in terms of uh young people defending streets against IRA attack and i think that's the narrative that we'll have to understand at this um period of time you know the IRA were seen as as a as a threat overall to people's uh social and political identity but moreover, people were interested in defending their streets, not even, you know, the area in which they lived. People were defending the very streets in which they lived. That's why I think ultimately you have a lot of fragmentation within loyalist paramilitarism because it was born out of uh, a need to defend individual streets. So you can have areas where one street is UDA, one street is UVF, and that's a kickback from, from the very early days of the trouble. So again, I think you need to go back to this loyalist backlash period um, to really understand the genesis of loyalist paramilitarism, paramilitarism as it would eventually form as a as a as a force as the nineteen seventies, eighties, and nineties went on. Um, I say there's a video that'll um be sent over with a slideshow um from around the time of uh, I think it was sort of August nineteen seventy one around the time of internment, and um it'll it'll show you the, the fear that really existed in places like. Donegal Pass, for example, in, in South Belfast, which is very close to Queen's University. Um, but 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 a, a, a written record of this um, sort of fear appears in a UDA bulletin where uh, a, an anonymous Protestant woman from the Old Park area is recorded as having said, like most moderates, I was fooled into supporting them at the start, i.e. the civil rights campaign. But now I have to take my grandchildren to school because they're stoned if they go alone. The older children who go by bus were, I thought, safe. But this week their bus was stopped at 8.45am and even as the children were getting off the bus they were splattered with petrol by these animals. There, even now, I use words that weeks ago I condemned other people for using. And the last child had still to get off when the bus was set alight. I broke my heart as a daughter in 1918 when my father was killed in France and again as a wife in 1944. Must I break it again as a doting grandmother? 
Can I not have a little happiness before I die? Yet now I find myself condemning the army for standing by, for watching as our city dies in agony. So later on that year you have the bombing of the, the four-step in on the Shankill Road in September 1971 after a Linfield game. Then you have the terrible um, bombing of, of McGurk's Bar in December 1971 by the UVF. And then the kickback from that is the horrendous bombing of the, the Balmoral Furniture Showroom in December 1971. The, the, four, the bombing of the four-step in and but the bombing of the Balmoral Furniture Showroom are are often cited by people um who who joined or formed paramilitary organizations at that time as being a real uh, sort of kick in the reality in terms of uh young people, young men sort of saying this is right, we need to do something about this. It's all well and good having, you know, the older men standing at the barricades, warming their hands at braziers and Doing that type of thing, but we really need to be picking up weapons and, and actively going after the IRA or the people who, who I think it was Clint McCulloch said, the people who are perceived as giving sucker to them and support. And you know, inevitably in in the minds of of um of of, of loyalists at that time, the, the tactic was to strike fear into the Catholic community by um targeting random Catholics for assassination. And hoping that that would put pressure on the IRA. Of course, as Billy Hutchinson said to me, it had the complete reverse effect, and you know it was completely counterproductive. But once he said that, once the IRA saw the random Catholics were being assassinated, the prominent members of the IRA melted into the background, and also a lot of ordinary uh, Republicans were compelled to join the IRA. And this only um, gathered momentum after the horrendous events of Bloody Sunday in January 1972. So, thinking around this time, there's a lot of, um, as we come into 1972 and, and the talk of the Loyalist backlash and um, the sort of orations of, of, of um, certain politicians, the most prominent one would have been William Craig, the former uh, Astronomer Minister of Home Affairs. He would have been, you know, an opponent of, of Terence O'Neill going back to the 1960s. And he started a new uh, movement called Vanguard, which was for uh, anti-Faulkner um, unionists to coalesce around. And the Vanguard movement attracted support from elements of the UDA, the Loyalist Association of Workers, and a, a sort of, it was a sort of umbrella group for Loyalist disenchantment at the time. But, um... In March 1972, Vanguard had been having these uh, large rallies where, you know, the Tartans would turn up and, and be um, stand for inspection, basically, um, it, uh, like like an army ready to go into, into war. And Bill Craig would walk down the lines of, of, of the Tartan members and inspect them as a general would inspect his soldiers. And, of course, the famous speech um, on Saturday, the 18th of March, 1972, um, by Bill Craig in Ormo Park, which was the large monster rally where I think anything between 50,000 and 100,000 loyalists were in attendance at Ormo Park, which again is quite near Queen's University on the on the banks of the of the Lagan River. Um, Bill Craig stood atop a, a podium, it was very dramatic, you know, he'd, he'd come to the um, the uh, the rally in an open top touring car flanked by motorcycle outriders who were part of the Vanguard Service Corps. Again, the Vanguard Service Corps is tied in heavily with uh, the Red Hand Commando. Um, and again, visually, it's very uh, reminiscent of the sort of Nuremberg rallies um, of, of the of the 1930s. And, you know, it was all very carefully choreographed to be menacing and to give a projection of you know unity and and people coalescing together in the in the face of um a sort of potential doomsday scenario where the stormont was on the verge of being prorogued by the, the british government and i know billy hutchinson has talked to me about this period of time saying that this was really the period where people like himself and other young loyalists just thought like the british government aren't doing anything here the army aren't doing anything the police have been disarmed the EDR are seen as toothless, um, and it's time for loyalists to take take matters into their own hands, and 
although Billy himself wouldn't have been um, a fan of Bill Craig, other loyalists did see this speech as being a, a potential green light to um, the um, violent activities that they would begin to embark on. So Bill Craig stood atop the, the podium with other loyalists uh, and spoke to the crowd and he said, There can be no compromise or concession to the enemy that assails our province today. We must build up the dossiers on the men and women who are a menace to this country because one day, ladies and gentlemen, if the politicians fail, it may be our job to liquidate the enemy. Now, later on in 1972, Bill Craig at the Monday Club, possibly under the influence of alcohol, stated that he was prepared to shoot and kill. Um, and he... The next day he stood by that statement after he um, sort of sobered up a wee bit but um, again strong words but very little action as you'll see from what you've read and hopefully from what I'm talking about tonight it was mainly young fellas from working class backgrounds who went out um, shot killed people and ended up doing very long jail sentences. People like Bill Craig um, kept their hands very clean. <coughs> Paisley was the same. And their legacy um, in terms of the, 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 the loyalist experience of that period of time is, is very mixed. I mean, it's almost unanimous that people would be, people who ended up in prison would be critical of Paisley. Less so Craig. There's, there's some people who would be uh, defensive of Craig, although there's a lot of people who'd be very scathing, but um, again, that's something to read read a wee bit about. But the, the political response to um, the loyalist backlash and the encouragement of its development um, by people like Bill Craig is um, you know a, a little um, offshoot that you might want to consider a bit more. <clears throat> So again, I'll just read a wee bit from from the um, from the book here about some of the experiences around this time, and how young young fellows who previously wouldn't have been involved in um, this type of activity were becoming more and more attuned and accustomed to cult, the, the, the the gun gun culture, um, which again, you know. Prior to the Troubles, uh, conflict breaking out, Northern Ireland was, you know, one of the most peaceful places you could imagine. Um, you know, crime, murder particularly was a very rare occurrence. So for things to change so rapidly on the, on both the Republican and Loyalist side uh, in the space of a couple of years, again, it ties into that idea of what Billy Mitchell said. I'm sure you've seen that quote before where Billy Mitchell who was a former, um, you know, brigade staff member of the UVF, he said that, you know, somebody didn't just fly over Northern Ireland one night and drop loony gas and, you know, everyone woke up as killers. Conditions were created whereby people made these choices and, and were, were, were forced into making these choices. So again, that's that's a narrative of, you know, um, ordinary young men in, in extraordinary times. But I just want to read a few excerpts from, a couple from my own book, one from Peter Taylor's book, um, just to give you a sort of flavour of, of, of how young men at this stage were finding themselves in a, in a sort of gun culture, which would um, eventually lead to a normalisation of violence. So, Sandy Rice, then aged 15, was a talented young boxer and member of the Woodstock Tartan. He recalls things changing at the end of 1971, with a subtle transformation in the dynamic of the Protestant youth gangs. And their interactions with older loyalists he says it went from the young newton fighting the tartan and the tartan fighting the craigie people were out to start armies this began to become increasingly apparent during skirmishes between the tartan and young newton and their catholic counterparts from the short strand in late 1971. the tartan would often emerge from the primrose bar or mitchell's an old building at the bottom of the woodstock road that had been turned into a youth club agro could be easily found around this area as it abutted the short strand Rice remembers that now and again you'd have seen older men appearing who were probably mid-60s, old UVF with leather jackets wanting to influence you into doing different things. <clears throat> Some wee lads were influenced into petrol bombs. For Rice this was a marked difference from his previous experiences. 
He says, different things that we wouldn't have used as a gang, the Woodstock Tartan, you'd have went and fought with your fists or clubs. When it came to these fellows who were influencing people, then petrol bombs appeared. One occasion stands out clearly in Rice's mind from around this period. There was one time the Tartan were fighting at the corner of Short Strand, and this guy went out of the crowd, a leather jacket guy, and fired a gun. That was the first time I ever seen a gun. And on the shankle at this time, Eddie Kenner. Eddie, interestingly, he was one of the early members of the YCV. Um, Eddie Kenner talks about how on his school, Habershack, he had the letters SYT, YCV, and UVF. And he says that was his graduation from SYT, <coughs> excuse me, to the Young Citizen Volunteers, to the Ulster Volunteer Force. And he feels that the UVF regarded his cohort of Tartan, Tartans as young rogues. He says they had us infiltrated, so they knew who, who was who. They had their people there, who were both YCVs and Tartan. They probably would have been identifying. Um, another one from the, the, uh, the Tartan book um, that I researched is about the response basically to to um events and how um young men were attending meetings at this time and Bobby Rogers, a uh, young fellow from South Belfast, who joined the um Shankle Red Hand and went on to become part of the village Red Hand when it was formed in the early days. Um he was part of the barricades. He was part of defending his, his community. He lived on an interface with uh, a road that connects to the Falls Road to, to the village near Windsor Park Football Stadium and at that stage it would have been easy for the IRA to come in carry out a shooting and just leave <coughs> so he would have been out doing his duty standing uh, at the at the um, local primary school during the night with the other men but he um, was encouraged to attend a meeting which I'm going to read about here Bobby was soon after invited to attend a meeting in Edinburgh Street, Snooker Hall, off the Lisburn Road. He says, There must have been 40, 50 there. Me and another guy were probably the two youngest ones in it. The ex-British soldier who had convened the meeting produced a Webley revolver. This handgun, this handgun was passed around to let people see it and feel it. For young men who had never before held a weapon, there was a frisson at this new experience. You grew up in the pictures watching these guys with guns. And here's one in your hand. It was quite exciting. The message was clear. This is what's going to happen. We're going to need these weapons. All big plans. At the end of the meeting, the ex-soldier made a passing remark, almost as an afterthought. The next meeting we have, we're going to be bringing a machine gun. Rogers remembers the reaction among those in attendance. We were going, machine gun? That'll be good. The initial enthusiasm about what had occurred at the meeting was tempered somewhat by an alarming experience the next evening. We were standing at the corner of Broadway and Multic Street playing football, cribbies as they called it. That's one to look up uh, the difference between cribbies and Kirby. Just a bit of light relief there, that might um, be something you'd want to explore. I know that was a debate that you know raged here uh, a couple of months ago, so maybe check that one out, cribbies v Kirby. <coughs> Seven or eight guys standing there just having a bit of a chat. And a woman whose husband had been at the meeting came around the corner and she was talking to us. She says, I hear there was a meeting there. We were sort of reluctantly agreeing. And she says, I hear you're getting a machine gun the next meeting. Me and my mate looked at each other and said, time to leave that group behind. Because even at that stage we realised that people can't keep quiet about things like that. That's potential problems all round. We were released from that flotilla which eventually became the UDA in the village. So again, just to go on slightly towards the end of the lecture, around this time you have the emergence and creation of, of loyalist no-go areas which are were in a response to the barricades in Free Derry and um, other republican areas. Um, Simon Winchester, who was a journalist with The Guardian at the time, uh, visited these loyalist barricades which were um, created in response. Now these weren't just flimsy sort of, you know, <coughs> pieces of uh, pallet thrown up. These were 
you know, um, concrete um, foundations in the ground, cement, that type of thing, barbed wire. Very ominous looking uh, menacing men uh, standing behind the barricades and Simon Winchester basically talks about the these. His initial response in The Guardian was that these barricades were more than a little ludicrous. Grown men and spotty youths crammed into jeans, three sizes too small for them, wearing sunglasses in the dead of night. It all seemed too pathetic for words, like toy time gone mad. But a few weeks later, Winchester had an encounter which led him to change his mind. And again, on the video here, <coughs> which Tony uh, will have access to, um, there's a couple of videos that I found of the Red Hand, uh, Flint McCulloch, Plum Smith, going through their unarmed combat techniques on the Shankle. And you can see that these guys, uh, well, at the time, maybe it appeared they were just messing around and doing these things for the camera, but these guys were involved in, in paramilitarism at the time. It wasn't just Toy Town gone mad. And Winchester is inclined to agree with us at this stage. He says, A girl from one of the loyalist women's groups who provided a convenient passport into the by now quite frightening Protestant back streets took me across the river. In Willowfield, as we walked down the road, all the signs pointed to trouble. Hundreds of crudely uniformed men were marching and wheeling, practicing karate chops into the cold night air, flourishing their rubber bin lid shields and waving axe handles as clubs. There was a subdued, sombre, but violent note in the antics of the men. It was comedy no longer. So, as we go on, we can see the second wave of, of loyalist paramilitarism emerging. You have the development of the young citizen volunteers um, under the leadership of uh, Billy Hutchinson in the summer of 1972. You've had the Red Hand Commando had formed in 1970. They were further galvanised in 71 and 72. The UDA were formed and there was a proliferation of the armed uh, militant loyalist response to the the um, ongoing ongoing troubles. And I think one of the interesting ones is, and there's a video, um, it's the Max Hastings documentary um, about the Tartan Gangs, which you can find on YouTube anyway. Uh, I uploaded it a few years ago. But there's a group of women interviewed in East Belfast and they are asked, you know, what do you think of these um, young fellas? They're just street hooligans, surely. They're causing a lot of hassle. And the women say, no, these are, if it wasn't for these young fellas, this area wouldn't be standing. And one of the women says something really prophetic. Uh, she says, um, It'll come to the whole Protestant community. I'll have to do what these boys are doing if they want anything. These are our boys of tomorrow. And it was true. A lot of the guys who were in the Tartan gangs did become on, go on to become the so-called boys of tomorrow. The second wave of loyalist paramilitarism after the initial convulsions of the 1960s. And one of the things I think um, is... Uh, you know really telling about this this period of time uh, to, con to conclude this lecture um, is a, a quote from uh, Bino Niblock. Bino, so basically to read from the book and then to include Bino's quote, I say, when faced with constitutional uncertainty and IRA violence directed at the communities from which they came, the Protestant youth gangs evolved into the more militant tartans. In May 1972, they were described by one woman in East Belfast as our boys of tomorrow. What did she mean by this? That became abundantly clear only a matter of weeks later when numbers of the Woodstock Tartan were recruited into the Red Hand Commando, UVF and UDA. Robert Niblock cogently outlines this journey from young working class citizen to volunteer. Bino says, Not only had 90% of us come through the gang culture, the Bash Street kids, young Hatons and the Tartan, together we all actually knew each other all our lives. We went to the same primary schools, joined the Life Boys and BB together, Junior Orange, football teams, but we mostly lived within a couple of hundred yards of each other. So we knew each other very well, our families all knew each other, and each of us was an integral part of that community. There were virtually no outsiders within our group. We knew the strengths and weaknesses of each other, who we could depend or rely on. The important thing is that we trusted each other fully. That of course was then, before things moved up to a different level, 
But the relationship we had with each other made for a tight ship within the gang culture and was replicated in the Red Hand Commando. So in a, in a sense that sort of um, is a crystallised um, summing up of basically what my research is about, what this lecture has been about. It's basically about the importance of kinship, <clears throat> common experience, um, common purpose and um, a sense of solidarity in the face of a common enemy that informed loyalist paramilitarism at this stage. I think the years 1970, probably June 1970 to the summer of 1972 is a pivotal period for you guys to explore in terms of the emergence and and um, dynamics of loyalist paramilitarism. There's a lot of fascinating stuff to, to you know, look at in subsequent years. Um, and I would recommend you look at some of the work done by Ian Turner, the Balaclava Street blog. And he developed some uh, more um, arguments about loyalist weaponry, tactics, that type of thing. And he's currently doing a book on the UVF, which will, will be out um, maybe in a couple of years. So that's also something to think about. And obviously the work Aaron's doing on, on the um, importance of handicrafts, common identity in, in the jails, the prison system and incarceration. That will also add to the story. And, and the other modules and, and, and reading materials that you have on, on this um, course will give a fuller picture. This is just one sort of small but crucially important dynamic of the, of the um, Ireland's Loyal Rebels um, story. Now, uh, obviously I'm not speaking to you face to face, but what I would like to say is I'm available on Twitter at gmulvena 1980 mm. or uh, my email address is gareth.mulvena at gmail.com I blog at gmulvena.wordpress.com so please feel more than welcome to use any of those means to get in touch with me and I'll be more than happy to either uh, FaceTime or Skype or um, email respond uh, the questions you guys have and again I'd just love to uh, thank Tony and I'd like to pay a little tribute to Alice who so sadly missed and you know, I haven't seen enough of Tony over the last couple of years uh, with one thing or another. I've got a young child at the moment and she's taking up a lot of my time and obviously the book with Billy is taking up a lot of time, which is a, a real honour to write and I'm really enjoying that. But I'd just love to pay tribute to Alice and, and dedicate this lecture to Alice um, who's so sadly missed and um, just her warm presence is, is so sadly missed uh, in Belfast and Tony, we all miss her and... Uh, you know, we all miss you, we don't see you half as often anymore, but look forward to seeing you again when this pandemic's uh, died down, as long as we haven't all uh, sort of <laughs> had to do a walking dead and uh, gone to war with each other. But look, um, yeah guys, stay in touch with me, I'll happily elaborate on any of the points I've made, happy to send you any of the videos from the PowerPoint, um, and happy just to help out in any way I can. This is a really important topic. Um, and hopefully some of you guys will go on to write about this area, write books about it, write journal articles, blog, whatever. And look, if you're ever in Belfast, uh, you know, look me up and I'll, I'll do my best to get a bit of free time um, to come out and meet you. But, you know, real honour and I hope you really enjoyed that lecture. And again, let me know if it can be of any further help. Thanks, guys. Cheers.